thank you for supporting the BCC academic series organized by the Lash Center for Teaching and Learning. Today we have the honor to introduce our very own Emily Brown and Susan Susa Mort in the presentation entitled Leap Rubrics and Information Literacy Assessment. A little bit about Emily and Susan. Emily Brown is coordinator of library research and instruction and is based at the BCC Fall River campus. Susan works as a research and instruction librarian for the BCC New Bedford campus. Not only they share their research on lib rubrics, but they share a love for dogs and fried cheese curds. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. That's very important information. <laughs> uh, today, Emily and Susan will discuss their initial findings, supplemental research, recommendations and the methodologies involved in collecting data about the lib rubrics, and they will also discuss the way in which the lib rubric can be adapted to reflect the needs of a community college environment. So please help me welcome Emily and Susan. Thank you. So I guess we don't need to do our general Good. intro. That was fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> and just an aside note, have you guys ever had fried cheese curds? Do not miss the cheese. I never did till we went to Portland, and I thought she was insane for getting me to try them, but it's the best thing ever. It's the weirdest best thing ever. <laughs> so we're here to talk about um, using rubrics for information literacy assessment. You are all, I, I'm assuming, familiar where the college a while back in 2013, we did assessment in all different academic areas using the LEAP Association. It was an AACU, right, which is... Association of American, American Colleges, Colleges and Universities, universities right. Um, so we were a part of that. We'll talk a little bit more about it. And the AACU's Leap Value Rubrics for Information Literacy were taken from the Association of College and Research Libraries um, standards. Since then, however, the ACRL has changed these standards to what they're now calling the framework. So um, in Inspiration, we were inspired by our use of LEAP rubrics to create a rubric, which you have both rubrics, and we will be referring to both of them as we go through. Um, but we were inspired by the LEAP rubric, and we wanted to create a rubric that refer um, reflected the um, ACRL framework. And we're going to kind of talk about how they're very intertwined. Like, there's some different language, and there's some different depth, but there's a lot of, like, really great stuff that you can use to both teach and assess. So we're really hoping that this is a, a good discussion for us to kind of you know, start the, the conversation here. Okay. So our first initial research, um, as we mentioned, started in 2013. In 2013, we were um, asked by Bob Rosendes, who's our Associate Dean of Libraries, to participate in the LEAP value assessment that was going on campus-wide. Um, Bob really wanted the library to be active, and so he asked us to do the information literacy rubric and see if we could assess, um, you know, some of the, the artifacts and some of the students' information literacy skills here at BCC. So essentially what we did in 2013 is Susan and I reached out to several faculty members who had come in for the traditional library one-shot which is what we call like that one opportunity to come into the library and teach students research skills. And um, several, several faculty members agreed and submitted their work to us. And we were able to, with them, assess these papers um, for their information literacy understanding and skills. And we used the Leap Value rubric to do that. Um, so we worked through the rubric and we assessed um, papers from English, uh, clinical lab science and early childhood education. So we actually did a wide variety of, of different topics. So our research in 2013 actually led to us making some, some recommendations for changes in information literacy here at BCC. And I'll let Susan kind of tell right. you what we did in 2014. So after initially looking at the results, we can't say we were very thrilled with them. Um, but what we did is we decided to move away from that one shot because basically when we get that one shot to go into your classroom or have your class come to the library, we have under 50 minutes to teach them how to search the online catalog for books, how to do scholarly research in a database, how to do web evaluation, and how to do citation. So as you can imagine, when a student leaves that session, 
th their minds explode. They're just pale and right. shaky. So what we did is we moved to a multi-session model, which was based off the University of Pittsburgh engineering model. So basically now what we've been doing is we have instructors who utilize us two to three times over the semester. So one class is just geared for searching the online catalog and database searching. Maybe the second class would be just looking at web evaluation and maybe your last class would just be let's just do citation. So this led us to, in 2014, we realized that yes, after assessing the multi-sessions using the leap value rubric, the student scores were higher. So it, it, it was really, I mean, it, it seems very obvious. The more exposure to these concepts, the better the students do. And I think for us, one of the clear things, you know, the clearest things were that the students had to come in and they had to have a need. There had to be an assignment, they had to understand, you know, why they were there, and then they had to have the time to really explore the resources. Like, if I sit here and I show you advanced searching in EBSCO databases, I mean, you know how complicated that can get. There just isn't the time to really process, process yeah. it and try it out. And, and I think half of what we do is get students to understand how it, how it feels to be in the database, how to drive, right? right? So we have some, we kind of covered a little bit of this in just, just right. the previous slide. Um, but obviously, the more access to the concepts, the better the students do. Um, we started to think that with more exposure, students could start to understand why. You know, it's like basically when we have one shot, we tell them where to click, we tell them what to enter, we tell them, you know, the basics. But when we have more time, we're able to kind of tell them a little bit more of the why. Why is it important to understand what authority is? Why is it, under, like, why is it important to choose a credible website over something that might be a little less credible? You know, try to have them understand that these things are you know, important to do and understand why and how it can fit into their larger um, academic career. Yeah. So with the framework, it lets you explore it a little bit more in depth and breadth than the leap value rubric does, as we will show you. So, um, yes, yeah, so you get a more richer, more complex understanding. Students understand that not only are they creators of their own information content, instead of like what Emily had said, point here, click here, there's your journal article, print it out, you're done. Right. Right. It goes no deeper, right? right. Has, is anyone, um, just curious, does anyone in here, is anyone familiar with the ACL framework for information literacy? The leap value. Okay. Well, you have so, a copy, so. Well, and we will be kind of going through it step by step. So if this is sounding alien to you, that's fine. We will kind of cover it. Yeah, we tried to tone down the li librarian needs speak. Glad to work. <laughs> it's kind of, it's library heavy. Right. It is what we are, we accept it. Okay, so this slide, what we're trying to do with this part of the presentation is talk about how LEAP, the LEAP value rubrics, actually kind of marry into the framework rubric and how like while the framework kind of couches it in different terminology, we're still, you know, it can still be evaluated using the LEAP rubric. So no matter what lens you're looking at these skills through, you can assess them in the same ways. So this is the LEAP value that we would use for assessment. And the, the um, criteria is that students evaluate information and its sources critically. Short sentence, sweet sentence, to the point, right? Do we have to talk about what that means? Now, if you guys look at your LEAP value rubric, which is the smaller one, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of shuffling of papers <laughs> for that, I apologize. Um, so on the left, you'll see evaluate information and its sources critically in the third box down. And then to the right, you will see that the students, in order to perform this at the capstone level, have to choose a variety of information sources appropriate to the scope of the discipline of the research question. So it's like they have to understand what sources best answer the question. And so for what we did is the framework then that it connects to is authority is constructed and contextual, right? So this goes beyond just choosing the best sources for the question, but understanding really deeply what authority is. So you can read over on the left the text that comes with the framework. Um, so one of the things that we start to 
want students to understand is why it's important to identify authority, right? You know, a lot of times I'll ask students, what is authority? And they're like, cops? And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, yes, but not in this case, right? Like, what does it mean to have an authoritative source? Are you authoritative themselves? Like, as writers, you know, they have to claim experience with the topic or say why it's important. And so students start to understand that authority can change depending on what you're doing research in. Um, so for instance, if I were a, or doing research on physics, right? Nuclear physics, which I'm not doing, but if I were, and I found like a Nobel laureate, he would be an authority in nuclear physics, but would he be an authority in like graphic art? But it's getting students to understand that just an authoritative person in one specific silo is an authoritative across all different subjects. So getting them to understand that when you ask a question, you identify the authority. Who do I need to seek out information from to find the most credible sources? So then you start talking about authority, like different questions require different authority levels. Maybe they don't need a Nobel laureate. You know, maybe they just need you know, their local congressman or information from their local teachers. You know, it depends on what their question is. Um, so they understand, in the framework, they understand that authority is contextual according to the question. It also pairs with information creation as a process. One of the things I don't think our students understand is that they are creators of information. Every time they write a paper or do that annotated bibliography, they are creating information as well. So when I, I say that to them, you can see the light bulbs kind of go off because they're just looking at themselves as students. I gotta get this project done, you know, and that's it. Um, and we also talk about in the classroom is just like the different ways that information can come at us. So for example, when we had the bomb blast going on over in Belgium, um, that came out to me immediately. I got that in my Twitter feed. So we talk to the students about that, right? So information can come at us more quickly in a social media standpoint. And then perhaps later on, someone down the line will write a journal article doing studies on perhaps post-traumatic stress syndrome with that event. And then maybe a little bit more on, there'll be a book out of it. So, it, so they can understand that research is a process. Right. Um, right. Well, and if I can add, like how many times have you collected works from your students and it's just a list of websites and you say to them you know well how deep is this information that you're actually digging into is it is it deep or is it shallow and they will admit you know this is shallow information it's on the web basically a web page is relatively short and so you say to them well how long did it take to create let's say a book on a topic versus a website. And they're like, oh, well, it took a, a book a lot longer to write than a website. And it's like, well, why aren't you using the book? Oh, well, it will take too long to read. And it's like, have you heard of this thing called the index and like the table of contents and how you can find things? And so part of what this does is it introduces them to the concept of the, the source as a different depth of information. Correct. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're looking at, when you're looking at different types of sources, you're looking at different types of information, all of which can be beneficial. Now, one of the things I use with my students all the time, and I think they like roll their eyes at me because they're not, like they don't have stock portfolios, but I'm always like, you know what the stock portfolios and the diversification, and they say diversify and they're like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And I'm like, okay. So we take a step back and we talk about like, why do you diversify a stock portfolio? So you don't lose all your money, right? You didn't put it all in one basket and then the stock market crashes and then it goes. Think of research the same way, right? If you're getting a variety of sources, you're getting a variety of information. Right. And those different kinds of information can be different across the different types of sources. So access the needed information. So this is another of the LEAP rubric um, components, which is essentially that they access the information that is needed. They go and they went out and they found sufficient evidence for their thesis. Yep, you ready. So we figured that went into the framework of searching as strategic exploration. I think students, and correct me if I'm wrong, they expect it to be a point or like search result done experience, right? right? 
And what we try to teach them with this framework concept is that searching is a strategic process. You have to have a strategy when you go out and you start searching. And a lot of this has to do with identifying the authority on your question. You know, thinking about what sources make the most sense. You know, it's starting to get students to kind of go past that, I'm going to Google it, and go, <laughs> it's funny that you, yeah, you're on point. OK, so like go past that information, like foraging stage into really deep research. So students understand that research is a process of what is sometimes discovery, sometimes serendipity. You know, how many times have we done research and we found this like little footnote, we've gone to that footnote and been like, this right. is the best source. Having students understand their research actually leads to more sources and that by just a close observant reading, they can find mm -hmm. other sources. And just to add on to that, what I tell the students, it's like a breadcrumb trail. Like, don't look at your sources just, bam, I've got, I need three sources for this paper. So I'm gonna do this one, this one, this one. Always look at, the, the, you know, what is the book saying at the end when they say, you know, suggested resources or more resources. Look at that journal article, look at the end. What are they citing as research as well? We can always get that journal for you, we can get that book for you. Um, and, and again, and that's, we, we try to show them that in these instruction classes as we're doing database searching, that it is a piece of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. That you can find, just like you said, that one footnote that will lead you to some wonderful information that you can then use in your paper. Right. And I think students have a hard time kind of grasping that it's like not a simple Yeah, process. they want it instantly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, and I think what this, and this framework does, it just allows us to see this broader sense of what information literacy could be, right? So the next one would be the leap value rubric. Do you have the value rubric with you? Somewhere. <laughs> you just had it. I just had it. I don't know how you do that. Anyway, you got it? Thanks. Mm. So if you look at what your capstone is, access and use information ethically and legally, of course this is the day I left my glasses at home, it actually says, would you read that for me? What's the capstone? I had to find it. Okay. Access is um, students use correctly all of the following information, use strategies, use of citations and references, choice of paraphrasing, summary, or quoting, using information in ways that are true to the original context, distinguishing between common knowledge and ideas requiring attribution, and demonstrate a full understanding of the ethical and legal res uh, restrictions right. on the use of published confidential right. and or proprietary information. We are expecting right. a lot. So basically all that is saying is that you need to cite your sources and that kind of right. leaves it like that. With the framework, we actually can explore a little bit further and give it a more, more richer, complex, dynamic um, definition. So for example, one of the frameworks that we think fits into this is that information has value. Uh, especially for those, you know, what we talk would be the voices that might be marginalized. I'm so glad Margaret Cox is here because a great example yeah. was that um, filmmaker who, um, what was her name? Um, Something Sullivan. Right. And she actually is a Caribbean film, uh, she's a film producer, writer, and she's given a voice to these people in the Caribbean to explore the arts. And she's got a very active Facebook page, very active Twitter, and so that here's where we look at where you know, you're not just looking at this one kind of point of view, that now we can go and look at information and see other points of view per what people's perspectives right. are. So a traditional publishing, right. you know, um, setup, you're going to have marginalized voices. Not everyone's going to get published in a traditional sense. And so we're actually in kind of like a brave new world of technology and new voices. And we're actually, we have access, we were talking about the hashtag um, Black Lives Matter. You talk about DeRay McKesson, who's going to run for um, mayor of Detroit, who has basically been a huge activist on something like Twitter and being able to you know, have these conversations in a forum like that, which is in a traditional publication forum. And so you know, we talk about how you have like all of this information that students are dealing with right now and that all of it does have right. value. And the other piece of it is too, is like when we look at information, are they trying to sell us something? Are they trying to persuade us their point of view? Um, is it just purely academic in matter? Are we just at a US census site, US government site, just looking at statistics? And it really makes them understand 
you know, and I always use, especially this time of year, it's perfect for information uh, instruction on this, is like the political meme, memes that are coming out. And I really have the students explore, like, okay, let's look at this political meme. They're saying this candidate does this. Let's go and do some digging and find out how accurate is this. And it really makes them, it just gives more meat to it than just saying, okay, make sure to cite your sources, because you know we don't want plagiarism, that sort of thing. So it just gives it that little bit more layer. Well, and you know, also speaking to the information has value, it's like we try to, to impress upon the students that the more credible the source you use, the more credible is your argument. You know, if I'm, let's say, one of the, the example that I've used recently is like factory farming. If I go to PETA, and get information from factory farming versus going to the USDA for information on factory farming, I'm gonna have one with more credibility over the other because you have one that's gonna be biased, you're gonna have one that's going to be you know, somewhat political, you know, all sorts of things versus you know, a USDA that might have a little right. bit more clear. We talk about that in my class too. We talk about .org. Sometimes students think a .org is a totally trustworthy source. But again, depending if you're an NRA, National Rifle Association, looking for stuff on gun control versus momsagainstguns.org, you're gonna find very different information. Right, and so like the information that they're using to support their arguments has value towards their own arguments. And so trying to get them to see that putting a little bit more effort into it will help them write a better paper or support their, their arguments with better okay. evidence. Right. Right. I mean, it's like rocket science to us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next is that students determine the extent of information needed, which means that they understand that they have to go and get a certain amount of information, right? They have to kind of say, okay, you know, if my question requires just websites, you know, they can go out and just get those, but if their question, if their research question requires them to go further and get a wide variety of sources, that they understand that. Right? So that's the leap value rubric part of it. We felt that this tied in really tightly to the framework concept of um, research is inquiry. right? And this is just kind of a way to go ahead and say that research is questioning. right? Students, I think oftentimes, I have been faced with students who kind of say, you know, um, I'm trying to remember what one student said to me one day. Uh, I, I want to say it was like something about welfare. Like all people who are on welfare, you know, are actually lazy. And I'm like, where are you getting that information? And so it's like, like if they questioned rather than started with a statement, if they start with an inquiry, like a, they're inquiring what's going on, and they learn to question. And that research often raises other questions. Mm -hmm. You know, that this isn't like you sometimes with research, you don't find a clear answer. It's not like you get to the mm -hmm. end of the research and you're like, Right. I'm done. There's no more questions to be asked, right? And so research's inquiry really impresses upon students that they need to rec uh, recognize that your research oftentimes focuses on unresolved questions. You know, as they're reading a paper, are they identifying what questions the author is raising? You know, oftentimes when we read scholarly articles, the author themselves will say, these are the questions that haven't been answered or yet. Or more research needs to be done on this, this topic. Right, and so they understand, okay, this isn't like, there isn't a an, an stop sign at the end of the road, you know, but there, there's actually more and more and more. You know, it's like the stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? So students understand that debate is part of the research process. You know, one of the things that we talk about so much is that, you know, it's not like someone publishes a paper and everyone's like, good stuff, right? Because people will have arguments about it. They will say, well, what about this point? What about that point? Hey, have you thought about this? And that's the nature of academic publishing, right? People will publish papers in response to other papers. People will build on people's research. Like, it's not something that just kind of stops. So th for them to kind of say, you know, how is debate a part of this issue? And so like they can identify within the papers, literature reviews, how they're kind of commenting on what the people who came before them did and how that impacts their own research. And then the students also learn to question their sources. You know, not that everything should be questioned, but you know, you're reading something, if you disagree with it, that's not a bad thing. You know, question it. Question where it came from. That leads to further research, right? It leads to further inquiry. Right. And you know, a great 
uh, research tool that we see a lot of faculty give is doing the argumentative essay, which really opens up students' eye, where they're forced to choose what we call a hot button topic. Climate change, believe it or not, that's still a hot button topic. Um, gun control, vaccinations, that sort of thing. So students can see that there's two sides to anything. I mean, as you know, anyone that works with statistics, those can be manipulated to prove a point or not prove a point. Um, is this, you know, especially, you know, you know, we just had that big, is the vaccination paper at this point when we had that? Oh, no. It's is it that? But still, it's a good example where you had this, you know, publication come out saying that vaccination in your children could lead to, you know, um, autism. And of course, that's been disproven. So it actually opens up their eyes that don't take everything you see, even in a journal article, as hardcore gospel. You got anything? What's that? Yeah. So the next leap value rubric is use, effect, use information effectively to um, accomplish a specific purpose. So that students understand that when they, they get information that they're using it effectively, right? Are they citing it correctly? Are they using the right evidence to support their claims? And we feel that this goes right into scholarship as conversation. Right? And this is probably my favorite frame. Right, I agree. I, I have to say, because Geeky it's like, librarian moment here. Oh, I know, right? right? <laughs> Come together. <laughs> Get a moment of the geeky librarians. But it's like scholarship as conversation, it is a conversation. Once students understand they're a part of it, right? Our students are a part of this conversation. They might not be published in academic journals, but they're having a conversation with you guys as your, their instructors. You know, they're having conversations with their, the resources that they're reading, and they're supposed to be understanding this at a better level. So students recognize that inquiry focuses on unresolved problems or questions. So they start to identify where there's gaps in the research. You know, they're reading something, and they're like, well, what about, what about this part of it? Why hasn't this part been assessed? And trying to get them to really like feed that part of their brain, like have them think about what they're reading. Students understand that debate is part of the research process and learn to question their sources. Am I reading the same, am I reading the wrong one? I am, I'm reading the wrong one. <laughs> okay, sorry. And I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> so one of the things that I love the most about this is that um, we were talking about this earlier. So research doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? So scholarship as conversation, really kind of brings about the ability to say, well, what happens when something is published? Susan brought out the, the example earlier of the, the vaccine article that connected the MMR vaccine with autism. And one of my favorite things to do with classes now is to say, okay, well, how many of you have heard of this debate? Are you guys familiar with this debate about vaccines causing autism? And so we talk about, well, how has this impacted your daily life, right? You know, there are, mumps and measles outbreaks in this country and these diseases have been eradicated here you know through vaccination and you know we're starting to see these things come back and i said the reason this debate started was because it was published in an academic peer reviewed journal called the lancet how many of you guys have heard of the lancet it's very prestigious it's right? a, yeah it's like a british medical journal <laughs> and so they published this article and so we talk about how once an article is published what then happens as part of the conversation so other researchers then read that article and they tried to replicate the results. And what happened was no one could replicate the results of that article. So what we talk about with students is that there are journal articles that have been retracted, right? But this journal article was out there for so long that the damage was already done, right? That people decided to not vaccinate their children because of a fear of autism and now they're getting mumps. And now that we have outbreaks, correct. Right. right. And so like we understand that the conversation between other researchers and the original research can lead to like monumental discoveries or even refutations, right? So this particular article was refuted and retracted. And a lot, another thing I want to talk about, like, or I talk about with students is like, how many of you guys have been affected by cancer? Yeah, everybody, I know. Yeah. So my mother had breast cancer. And as she was going, finishing up her chemotherapy, um, the doctor said, we are, we are starting a new trial. Would you like to be a part of this research trial and be on this one specific drug for 10 years? And my mom was like, oh, sure, why not? I don't, know. I don't know how she said it, but she was like, yes. And so I said to the students, I said, well, what do you think they're doing with that information? You know, they're taking it and they're saying, okay, was there a recurrence in this group of people that took that drug? 
and then they're going to publish a paper, and then that paper is going to lead to further research, and they're going to recommend the use of this drug in a specific group of people, and how that... Right, and just to tag on to that, it's a really good segue, too, to talk to students when they're looking at academic journals, particularly in the health sciences. What's a cohort study? What is it when it's a systematic review or a systematic analysis? Because even within the journal articles themselves, they have to understand what the different methodologies were used in these. So for example, if your mother was a part, or a randomized control trial, an RCT. So these are all important pieces of information. So students just look at these journal articles, and this is why it's so key, and it's wonderful when a faculty member lets me do a multi-session, is that we can take a moment and talk about what these journal articles are trying to say. And we actually have done where we break down Mm -hmm. the academic peer-reviewed journal article for them. You know, what does it mean with the abstract? What does it mean with results? What does that mean? And so by giving them the tools and the vocabulary to look at a journal article and right. break it down and tell them, you don't have to read these like a book. It's okay to go right to the conclusion. You can look at the end. Um, that's fine. But this is where the scholarship, this conversation piece, really right. makes it a little bit more, they, they, they get it. Well, they start really realizing how the conversation directly impacts them. Right. You know, when you start talking about cancer research or the anti-vaccine movement, you start to understand, like, oh, this actually has an active impact on my life. You know, this isn't just some ivory tower or something I have to do when my teacher requests it. It's actually a dynamic part of, like, what makes us healthy and what, you know, science, scientific research. Right. So these are just some of the things we do um, when we, with faculty, when we come in and use, teach information literacy to the classes. I mean, every class we do is different because it's so specific to what your assignment is. But just for example, you do the Twitter one, you so want to talk about that? One of the ways, like, I think I mentioned this earlier, was we would talk about how scholarship is conversation. And I would actually use Twitter and the, the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And so what I would do is have a conversation on like, well, how do you join the conversation on Black Lives Matter? How do you become a part of that? You hashtag it, right? And you become a part of this larger conversation. And so how do we then talk, transition from that into scholarship as conversation? Well, what is the hashtag of academic, I know I'm reaching here, but seriously, like what, are the, what is the hashtag of an academic article? The citations, right? So like, by signing something, they're tagging it to an original source. They're kind of joining that conversation. They're creating a research line. So to get them to understand that conversation is part of the research process. Mm -hmm. We also do things, it's just called the matrix, which the students always get excited. They think I'm gonna show the Keanu Reeves film. But sadly, no, what it is, it's almost like doing a lit review, but not. Um, so basically, you know, when you have a student, you say you need to use five resources in this paper. They'll quote one here, one there, one here, and I'm done. What we try to show them that it's okay to utilize, like say, so I'll give them a chart that they can fill out. Look at all your resources. Write down what are your main themes that you want to write about. Then go back into these resources that you have in front of you, and perhaps you have two authors that agree on the same thing. It's okay to use those two authors and talk about that. Or maybe you have one author that doesn't agree. That's okay too. You can use them together. It doesn't have to be separate. And I, right. and I have to say that this matrix was introduced to us by Howard Timber. And I had never heard of it before. And he's like, hey, can you teach my students the matrix? And mm -hmm. it was like literally like, we loved it. <laughs> like this is the grid, like why didn't I know about this right. when I was in college? Because it's literally a grid where you go through and you say author A says this about this topic. Author B says the same thing on that topic. Author C disagrees. Right. And it creates this like matrix of when you're writing your paper, you just grab you know, what the author says. It's such a logical way to right. look at things that it's really, I think for us, been such a fun way to teach students how to like read the paper. And like, again, I just love it when you see, you do, you see those light bulbs go off like, really? We can do that? Yes, you can. <laughs> you can create a table in Word and put stuff in. <laughs> right. So we also talk about um, how to use a book to find further resources, right? So you talk about, you know, you're reading a book, you're reading a book, and, you know, um, how many of you guys are, are familiar with Michael Pollan? He's kind of a food, he talks about food, uh, one of my favorite authors, I love that guy. So, you know, you're reading a chapter, and Michael Pollan's talking about X, Y, Z, and all of a sudden he quotes Jeremy Bentham. And I was like, well, why can't you use that quote? You know, you can use, you can go and see if we have that library book that's Jeremy Bentham talking about that thing. And there you've got yet another source. It's like reading to observe. And so then showing them how you can use one source 
to then find more and more and more. Right. Right? Read those citations, mm -hmm. use the footnotes, understand that once you find that perfect thing, it can just be like an explosion of really good right. resources. And of course, then we do the straight out. We've done the literature reviews, which is another great tool to have students look at all their different sources and whether they agree or disagree. We've done annotated bibliographies, which is a staple. <laughs> but we love it because, again, the students have to look at all these different resources and write about why you would use this in a paper. And then again, website evaluations, I feel, go so long with the student, um, particularly when I do it with the health sciences. So for example, um, one of the ones we look at, it's this blood pressure um, website, like FAQs. But when the students start doing digging about who's behind the website, it's yeah. Pfizer. Right. So then you gotta ask the student, would you trust a pharmaceutical company to give you information about blood pressure? Right. So it just really, teaching the framework, having these multi-sessions has really opened up a whole other dimension, and I think the students really just get more into it, I think, well, than just having to spit out, you, you know, know and the I, quotes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, and I know the framework is kind of new to you guys, and it's, it's brand new to us, and we're just kind of getting our teeth into it, but what we've really liked is that it's given us a vehicle to really talk about these kinds of deeper concepts, and, you know, we, we love to be able to explain to students, like, you know, it's, I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a room and they're like, oh, God, this girl again. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, but it's good stuff. You know, it's really fun. I, you, just, I, won't be open I swear to, to God. God. But it's like, you know, giving students that ability to kind of say, oh, this is important. And I can kind of get into this if I allow myself to get into right. it. So it's what? So, I was just going to say, just a little background with the framework. This is actually very relatively new with the ACRL. And there's some debate. Um, the AACU will be adapting it. So that leap value rubric will be reflecting the framework eventually. The stuff that we did with this rubric is groundbreaking. And not to toot our own horns, but we will. Um, we have institutions all over the country emailing us to help them create their own rubrics. We were lucky enough to present with Sharon Mader, who is the queen of the framework with ACRL. And we actually had a bigger room, so I don't know what that says. But, um, <laughs> but no, it's really, I mean, if you Google Leap Framework and uh, Leap Value and Framework, we're like hit three or four. So, I mean, this is groundbreaking work. <laughs> <laughs> B BCC librarians right blushing. here. Blushing, blushing. Um, so the, the rubric you have in front of you is essentially, we, we use LEAP. You guys use LEAP. LEAP is something that we're familiar with. But when, like I said, when this framework came out, we were kind of like, we want, because of our experience, we wanted to create a, a, a rubric with the new framework and see if we can do it. And you can see how similar it is to the, the LEAP rubric. You know, so we kind of took the framework concepts and placed them in capstone, you know, less than capstone levels. Now, some of the conversation, I want to have, I think we want to have a little bit of conversation about the actual framework. Now, there is debate, right? If you guys read the capstone level, I don't know how many of you guys might be thinking, like, is this the level our students are at at a two-year school? And we said that. We're like, maybe for our students, we would want the capstone to be at a level three. You know, that's where we want to get them. And then the four-year schools are where they get to that, that four. Because when you read the context here, you know, a lot of this is geared towards four-year graduate school universities. And so what we wanted to do was create something where we could introduce these concepts at a level where the students here could really embrace them and right. understand them. Because there's no reason that our students And, and that's what's so great about the framework. It's, it's so, flexible. It reminds me of when they talk about the pirate code from the Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, they're just like guidelines, right? And that's basically what the framework is like. It's just giving librarians more guidelines and flexibility to introduce. And this has actually started this wonderful conversation. I mean, I'm on the ACRL framework listserv, and there's just always some wonderful conversations coming out. And so, you know, we know that the framework can be assessed with either our rubric or the leap value rubric. You know, these concepts marry well together, right? The AACU original leap value rubric was created from ACRL standards. Right. You know, as Susan mentioned before, like it's they're going to retool it thinking with the framework. We just kind of, you know, did it first. We beat them to it. <laughs> so what we do when we assess papers or artifacts is we get professors that we've worked with, with one shots or with multiple sessions to give us their students' papers, 
right? And this is actually something that we had never experienced before as librarians. I had never seen a student paper before this. And it was kind of really humbling. You know, we never get to see that end result. And so we would redact the information, we would remove the student's name and assess it ver via the framework rubric or the leap value rubric. And we did it the same, you know. So you would take it and you would give it a score and then, you know, see where the student, you know, landed. And so this was really something we would like to kind of take and roll into future endeavors. Right. Because so, we did, we did um, norm it with the new framework rubric that we created with old papers, and the numbers pretty much were the, were same. the same. So, so we, right. yeah, so we, the, we assessed it with LEAP, and we came up with a certain set of numbers, and we reassessed it with our, with our framework rubric and got very similar numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's like the assessment is available. Um, so one of the things we'd really like to kind of reach out and start talking about is future collaboration. You know, we're really kind of geeky about this and we're really excited and we want to, you know, start talking with faculty members that want to say, you know what, I really like this concept. Is there a way, you know, I have this assignment, is there a way we can work together to kind of work this concept into that assignment? You know, we'd love to kind of help with stuff like that, like figuring out how to kind of get these these concepts in on the ground level. And I know, of course, with you, with me down in New Bedford, I've already been working with faculty to help create assignments that are actually using the framework concepts with, along with their assignment. And so far, I've had some really positive feedback. So I started doing this last fall. I got really uh, a lot of, a few right. instructors tell me that their paper scores were higher and that they were very pleased and happy about that. So we continue moving forward. Right. And even if, if all you have is a one-shot session, you know, that's, we'll, we'll take it. You know, we're not going to say It's our bread that. and butter. Right. It pays the bills, right? It keeps <laughs> the lights on. But, you know, we, we are here, and we want to, we, we really want to explore these concepts and make a better, well-rounded student yeah. if we possibly can. And I think it helps with their anxiety. I mean, we talk about retention a lot, and, you know, a piece of that is the support services we offer here, and the librarians are a piece of that. So a student, I can't tell you, I've had many tears sitting in my library. But once you sit down with them and you help them out, the relief is just palpable. I mean, you can see it in their faces. And, like, you know, I can come to you for help and you can help me with this assignment. Well, and, even just understanding that, like, they're walking in the door as college freshmen. You know, this isn't a skill that they have. It's a skill that they learn, you know. And so part of being here is part of learning academic research. It's learning how to do it, how to read it, how to not, like, download a scholarly peer-reviewed journal article and go, like, oh, my God. Right. <laughs> what is this? And like kind of say, okay, deep breath. I understand that some of this might be over my head, but this is part of why I'm here. Right? I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna digest it, and I'm gonna work with it. So do you guys have questions about the framework? I know we kind of like threw a lot at you with all of these concepts, but what do you think about them? Do you think that they're intriguing? Do you think that they're like, oh my God, this librarian hooey? <laughs> Is who we word? That's not a swear word, right? <laughs> We've been bleeping you the whole time. <laughs> well, I, 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 would, I have a comment to, to make because I'm so glad that we are recording this session. Uh, and it's going to be in the YouTube channel of BCC because it will reach um, the audience that we want it to reach. Right. And uh, this is very interesting. I think that it will definitely call the attention of, I mean, I am personally very interested. And uh, I will definitely be seeking your services. Fantastic. Excellent. So we'll open the floor for questions, please. Or not. Come on, questions. <laughs> you have in the capstones uh, a tool. So what I, um, I, I, I'm checking about the, the use of the word for measuring the capstone. The student will recognize and understand. However, in the information literacy value rubric, you have a more specific uh, verbs I mean, coming from defines, access, choose. It seems to me that uh, the capstone are more, um, you, um, this one are more, mesh, uh, let's say, you can manage the measurement of the assessment. Right. And this one is more like, an, based on the opinion of the person who is uh, addressing the evaluation. You know what I mean? I, and I think you're right. And I think like having used both rubrics, you have a little bit of that either way. Like even though there were, you know, kind of clear verbs, like you said, in the leap value rubric, like defines and does this and does that. Like there were still parts where we're like, well, you know, you could make the argument, you know, like we had a 
lot of conversations about how to grade something. So like, I think what we appreciate with the, the more fluid kind of relaxed one kind of allows you to take the work as a whole. You know, instead of like being so, right, right, holistically. And, and I think that this needs some tweaking. I do. And, and we should have prefaced it too. This is only version 2.0. Right. So we're still, this is a, an organic process. Yeah, it's not finished. As a matter of fact, we had a wonderful conversation with a university out of Maryland. They called us very interested and they had some great ideas. So yeah. we're going to be working with them to tweak it even more. I mean, this is just. Well, brand and I, new. I think right. what we would like to see is if you were interested in using these framework concepts and you took this and you took a big giant red pen to it and did something right. that was a little bit more, something that was easier for you to right. assess, we'd love to see that. Right. You know, really what we did is we took the framework and tried to form it into something that we could use for assessment. We are not claiming that this is the perfect no. tool. Like I said, we're still, it's we, organic. Well, Right. Yeah, and it's like, you know, once you've taken a look at it and used it, let us know. You know, let us know what worked for you because it's like, I think for us, right. when we were working through this, we had to have a lot of conversations. Well, how do you measure if a student understands that, you know, authority is constructed? Right. <laughs> Like I said, that conversation with the university we had just a couple weeks ago, they had some really great ideas. We were like, bring it. I'm like, you know, take it, tweak it. That's why our copyright license is, you know, do whatever you want with it, basically. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, when we're hoping to hear back, and who knows, yeah. this might be tweaked again. So well, we'd love just a big learning yeah. process. I really a good observation. really like so much that he's so open to different sources, like his framework. Yes, as you were talking about scholarly interaction, uh, scholarly community, including the students that are part of it. Yes. I mean, this dialogue. Yes. yes. Right? That's and the part they need to we're get. talking about the academic journals that usually we refer them to or they're looking for when they make a search in the library. Okay. But also, as you said, media, you, know, you, you mentioned Margaret's use of documentary. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure artwork or pictures well, that might Yeah, you know, well, it's like, I think, I think what the framework does, in a way, is kind of helps to inspire, like, that aha, aha moment, you know? One of the things I was, I was boring Susan to never, death the other day. Never. Well, I was talking like, for some reason, I got it in my mind to start researching animal consciousness. And so I'm researching animal consciousness, thinking it's like, oh, it's gonna be an open and shut case. You know, animals are conscious, case closed. And then it was like, but what is consciousness? And I'm like, that's a good question. <laughs> How do you measure consciousness? Is consciousness different in humans than in cats or in dogs or in cows? Like, does, does consciousness evolve differently? And it just opened up this whole, like, what I thought was going to be a relatively, like, simple, like, research question was just, like, right. I'm no, reading articles it's, it's on valid. fish consciousness. Or the opposite end, when you have a student that wants to do research on a particular area, and guess what? There's not anything right. really done in this field. And that happens yeah. too, and that's yeah. okay. You gotta tell them that, you know, that's okay. Just means that it's a brand new field, it's being explored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like, I think that, that students just kind of need to understand that this is, a, this, is a, this is a different world. And once they, they become comfortable in it, it makes sense. Right. And so it's just getting them to be comfortable with it. And like I always tell them, my favorite quote from Einstein is if we knew what we were doing, <laughs> it would not be called research. Right. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you so much for Thank coming. We appreciate it. <laughs>